unfolding together in Dialogue Village. Hi, Heather. Hi, Johnny. <laughs> How are you? I'm pretty good. How great. are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Um, it's great to have these transla transatlantic lovely connections. Yeah, I enjoy it from the side too. I did a bit of preparation, but there's just something about the the amount of um, interesting stuff that you're offering out into the world um, that via your website. Um, so we could explore that a little bit. Um, and the other thing um, I've always, as you know, mm -hmm. I've always been intrigued in is is uh, where you went to school. <laughs> and, and so we could start with that, perhaps. Um, would you mind mm -hmm. explaining a little bit about, about this amazing school that you went to? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, when I found the Autism Dialogue online, I was very intrigued both because it's a community of just autistic adults that we can get together. And I don't really have that here, but also because the whole idea of the dialogue was very much like my, my schooling. And uh, I went to a very small private liberal arts college in Santa Fe, New Mexico. There's also a sister campus in Annapolis, Maryland in the States. Um, and it's founded on what we call a great books program, which is, basically the every subject for all four years every single class is a socratic seminar and it follows the development of western intellectual thought from the ancient greeks up to well we sort of like barely reach the beginnings of the 1900s um, so with, when you say the liberal arts is that is that the same as the seven liberal arts the trivium and the quadrivium and yeah essentially okay Cool. And um, it, it's somewhat modeled on the like a medieval English education, actually. It, it's basically, you, we don't have textbooks. We have just the, the original books that the people who created that subject wrote. So like in our science classes, we're not reading about chemistry and physics. We are reading um the, the writings that the alchemists who became the early chemists wrote and like reading their letters back and forth to each other and trying to figure this out. And we're recreating their experiments and um, trying the things that they tried. And, um, and then it like follows them up through like, as they're sort of investigating the, the properties of chemicals, the properties of the earth, like, as they're like building physics, we read Galileo, we're reading um, Newton, Einstein, um, like reading their original writings, not reading stuff about them. Like we never read anything about them. Yeah. And like what you do is you, you read a, whatever section it is assigned for that class on your own, talk about it with your, your classmates and whatnot, and you get to class and you just discuss it. If you sit around a table, there's 12 to 18 people and one tutor, we call our professors tutors. And you just discuss what it was and try and figure it out and grapple with the ideas. Fantastic. Um, Is that a quite an intuitive process then? In some ways. Um, More or less didactic than information processing. Yeah standard yeah. education mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's not didactic at all although you do learn a great deal but it's more like let's figure this out together let's learn how this works that sounds really holistic mm -hmm. if that's the right word yeah and because a lot of these people that were reading their works they weren't like specifically just chemists or physics physicists they were also philosophers they were historians they were like they worked in all these different fields because at the time when it was being created, they weren't like really separate fields. That's a very modern framework to education. So we're reading them and their thoughts about all sorts of different things within even a single essay or a single letter or. Um, yeah, I remember um, coming across um, the sacred geometers like Keith Critchlow and John Michel. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a, um, I did, a bit of them um, at uni um, early on, 
you know, before they realized what I was up to and, and knocked it out of me. Uh -huh. uh, but this idea that um, art and science um, are separate is, is a modern idea. It used to really? all be yeah. all, all, all be combined and, and that used to really fascinate me. And it just reminds me as well of, of um, uh, Catherine Long, who we just had on recently, uh, the the wisdom of self healing systems mm -hmm. and and much more uh, like a, a holistic approach to life. Yeah, because what they were offering was so very different. Mm. Uh, decided, you know what? I really want this education. This is how how to think. Like that's how they often talk about it. Is you're not learning a subject so much as you're learning how to think, how to learn. And no matter what you do after you graduate, you can um, you can learn anything because you know how to investigate, how to get really in depth, how to figure out the complex things, and yeah. it serves you very well in that respect. Yeah, I'm wondering now about the fine art degree that I did because I'm wondering how much of that philosophy seeped through because it felt. A little bit it wasn't explicitly like that but it felt a little bit like that mm -hmm. mm. and that's and interestingly that's where i got introduced to dialogue bohm dialogue really yeah in my final year um mm -hmm. there's a principal lecturer hester reeve she's been a, a member of the bohm dialogue group um in england for a long time for years and years. i think they're the oldest and she's managed to bring it into the curriculum of the fine art degree. Mm -hmm. That year, while that was my final year, she brought it in, and and now it's okay. compulsory. It's compulsory for for new students to to yeah. do their own dialogue, and that's um, basically, cool. in a sense, they we you know you, you students would would typically sit around and critique some art. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a well we take the art away. And then you've only got thought and language as as the as the tools and the space as the mean as the canvas, mm -hmm. in a sense. So so it's it's purely generative dialogue. And I had some fabulous experiences, and that That's was awesome. the best part. Yeah, it was the best <laughs> part of, my, of my fine art degree. So imagine doing that for every single class that you ever took for four years straight. Yeah, oh, I'd love to do that. Sometimes it gets a little maddening frankly, but imagine. it's amazing at the same time. Yeah. Do you think it's so? Yeah. So you reached out to, I mean, I'm looking to, to weave all this together. We've got autism. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you want to say a little about your, a bit, a little bit about your uh, autism from a personal and professional point of view and how that weaves in mm -hmm. to all of this. Well, <sighs> I think my story in some respects is going to be similar to a lot of adults who got a diagnosed as adults is that I always felt like there was something, something off, something different, depending on who you talk to, it was different, it was special, or it was wrong or not right or some, <laughs> there was this always this voice inside of me wondering why I was broken. Um, and my family was very supportive in general and had a very loving parents and didn't feel like that was a problem, but it was always just something, mm. um, it was hard to make friends. I would say the wrong thing all the time. Couldn't stop certain traits like just some things were really hard for me. And also some things were really, really easy. And I was really good at things and got a lot of praise for certain things, um, like mental math and whatnot. Although math on paper became my downfall. Um, it's actually why I didn't become a physicist. That was my special interest for a long, long time. Uh, but I couldn't always get the numbers right. Like I knew how to do it, but I would mix up a number on the paper yeah. and the answer would be wrong. And so of course you got the problem wrong. Um, so this idea of you, of you feeling broken, was that, mm -hmm. was that from you or was that from mostly from 
the pressure from outside? It was mostly external from, from society, from school mostly. Um, there's little bits of it in my family, which I'm now looking back and saying like, okay, so my parents, I'm an only child, so it was the three of us. Um, my parents were very, very supportive and mostly wrote off a lot of things. So, oh, she's just like her dad. Oh, she's just like her dad. But we, looking back now, we're pretty positive. My dad was also autistic. So it, um, and my mom was very much of an introvert and highly sensitive. So we were just homebodies and it wasn't a big deal in our family, but there was still like this internalized ableism. Um, but within the extended family, I did get more pressures occasionally of um, Heather's weird. Oh, that's just Heather. She's just like that or things like that. And, but I got a lot of it from school, a lot of it from just society, other activities, um, other kids. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so when I went to St. John's, as you can imagine, this is a school that was populated more by nerds. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and so it, I, I made more friends than I ever had in my life. There was more people who were just a little bit off or a little bit weird and being weird was not just acceptable, but in some ways kind of prized yeah. and not just in my way, but in all sorts of different ways. Like you kind of have to be a little bit weird to, to thrive at St. John's. And so I made some friends and in, in many ways it was a very, very positive experience. But then I hit the real world of jobs and work and, um, and it was like, I was good at the job, but it was hard and I couldn't make it work with my coworkers and my boss. And, and there was some aspects to it. Like I was really good at the work, but everything around it was just stressing me out. And and it reached a point where I just, I couldn't do it anymore. Like I was struggling just to get myself out of bed in the morning, um, struggling to get through the day. I just had no energy whatsoever. And I kept it up for two and a half years, close to three years. And I just reached a point where my body shut down and I couldn't do anything anymore. Uh, I couldn't get out of bed. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't function. Mm. Um, my friends were concerned. They would like, they saw very clearly I was in a deep depression. Mm. Um, also looking back, there was a lot of burnout, mm. um, chronic fatigue. And I basically didn't get out of bed for nine months. Mm. And I did some some personal reflection and some interior searching and I did get a little bit better and managed to, to recuperate to some extent. And I thought I'd made enough changes and that things were gonna get better. And um, I got a part-time job just at a local store for a couple of months, just to have a little bit of income and um, then started nannying, which was really good for me. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I really love kids. I work really well with kids, especially little ones, little ones are teenagers. I'm like really great with babies and toddlers and teens. <laughs> um, what's, and then I started wrong with the ones in the middle. I like them, <laughs> but it's not like my, it's not my niche. It's not like what I'm really great at. So let's come on to, to your working mm -hmm. in a minute. I'm, I just mm -hmm. want to, I didn't know whether to, to say this, but what's, what stuck out for me just then. Was, yeah. was you spent nine months in bed and I was wondering if if you saw the symbolism of that is the womb you know the gestation <gasps> did you feel reborn <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it that way before okay okay um, I, thought, I was wondering I was wondering processing if, now <laughs> it's okay I and mean, to some extent yeah I did feel a bit reborn but it wasn't it wasn't enough yeah, yeah. Like, so when I was nannying, I went back to 
to school part-time to get my teaching certificate. It was always kind of what I was wanting to do was to become a teacher. And I got my teaching certificate and I started teaching. Um, this took about two years or so. And I started teaching high school and that was really, really good. I'm a very good teacher, got lots of praise. Um, but the social dynamics were, again, very challenging. When mm -hmm. I'm in the role of a teacher, I was fine, but like navigating the social dynamics of the teaching staff and whatnot. <sighs> yeah. But anyway, I managed to teach for about five years, um, but I burned out again. It was just right. complete shutdown. Right. Um, and at that point, I knew I had to do something differently. I couldn't keep doing this. Yeah. And a friend made a random comment about an article she saw that autism presents differently in women than in men. And it was like a light bulb went off. Okay. And I went down that rabbit hole of research and it turns out, oh, this fits. This mm -hmm. is the thing. And that's kind of when I felt like I was reborn. Okay. It that's changed nice. everything. So is that is that the point where you decided that you could use your experiences and channel it all into the Autism Chrysalis Project? Uh, that actually took another couple of years. I knew that I needed to make some major changes and that I couldn't do it the way I was. Um, I had a really good therapist that I'd been working with for a couple of years at that point. And we had made a lot of progress, but now we had this new framework to work with and that helped a lot. So, so the, per the therapist was an autism, autism therapist? Not specifically, although she was very helpful and yeah. she, was, she was actually really, really good for me. Um, That's great. But no, I had to go see a, di a different person to get the official diagnosis. Yeah. Um, but I, <laughs> I actually bought a, a cargo van and converted it into a camper spent almost a year converting the van and set out to travel the country and basically just investigate myself. And I sp spent almost three years on the road Did you? just doing personal stuff. It, it wasn't really about the external where I was going. Um, it was basically just a daily search for free camping. <laughs> yeah. Um, was, and that, was that quite an adventure for you? It was, there's and it brought people, up all sorts of things. There's a lot of people that have seen Nomadland and, and have read it, and, and there's a uh -huh. lot of people talking about that at the moment because it's opened up, you know, I don't think a lot of people realised that that was going on in the States. We, yeah. Did you, were, were you part of uh, the, the any traveller communities? No, not really. Yeah. Um, I tried to stay away from people as much as possible yeah. to be honest there's something about the word chrysalis as well that makes me think about rebirth is that mm -hmm. yeah what? that's intentional yeah yeah when i was living in the van i spent a lot of a lot of time a lot of personal effort energy just figuring myself out and coming to terms with things, healing old wounds, um, mm. working through anger. I had a lot of anger that I didn't even realize because I always put myself out as a very happy, positive person. Um, and I didn't realize how much anger I was burying for so, so long about not being able to be who I really am and having to conform to other people's expectations in order to be acceptable. Um, yeah. All the ways that people, that like teachers and doctors could have helped, but didn't because they were so focused on the, the behavior or focused on like the goal or focused on some small aspect that is a symptom, not the actual root of, well, Heather's not doing okay here. Like she needs some help, but they're just like, you know, they didn't know most of the time they really didn't know what to do, mm. but I got the brunt of it as just, oh, she's a problem. Mm. 
And the, and the chrysalis? Well, I discovered that when I was able to face those hurts, those like really deep wounds, the anger, the the it could have been different, that it could have been better, the um what's literally a complex trauma, like gaslighting from you should be something that you're not trying to conform to some impossible standard. Like when I really faced that and allowed myself to see it clearly and face the fact that I didn't actually like myself, which was a really, really hard thing to admit. But at some point it just like smack in my face and I couldn't turn away from it. Then I started being able to, to forgive people and to have compassion for that little girl who just really wanted someone to be her friend and didn't get that much. And um, and recognizing like what is instead of what it should be yeah. and really facing the reality of who I actually am, I started to, to forgive myself, to forgive the people around me. And it changed. I mean, it, it might sound cliche or something, but it really did change my life. And I started seeing who I am and what I can do. And there was this moment that I was just realized like, I was put on this earth the way that I am, which means that I have a right to be on this earth the way that I am. And I like who I am now. That is so powerful. That is so powerful. I feel quite moved to that. Um, you've done so much soul searching and there's so much genuineness about, about you and what you're bringing to the world. <laughs> Congratulations. And you got a fantastic smile. It's got to be said. Um, so yeah, and I started smiling more. Like my mom keeps commenting, like, you smile so much now. That's great. <laughs> I didn't used to do that. Um, That's great. Wow. And and so is the chrysalis a butterfly now? Is that is that the work of supporting people with all these incredible projects? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting that like when a when a caterpillar sheds its skin to mm. and like goes inside of itself because it, it's its skin forms the chrysalis. What happens inside that is that the the caterpillar actually breaks down into this sort of DNA goo, yeah. and it literally becomes something else it forms out of that goo a different creature that crawls out of there but it's made of the same thing like it's not that the that the caterpillar was a bad form of a butterfly or an incomplete butterfly it was exactly what it was supposed to be at that point in its life and in the chrysalis that goo is exactly what it's supposed to be at that point in its life it's not an incomplete butterfly or a dead um, caterpillar it's perfect the way it is and the butterfly is perfect the way it is and it's it's not a different version of the other like it's it's just right and um and all of the times in my life like all of these things that I faced all of the the difficulties and the triumphs like every point in my life I was it was exactly where I needed to be at that moment it wasn't a bad version of who I am now yeah that's that's a beautiful symbol the goo the goo is perfect as it is as goo mm -hmm. that's because it's meant to be goo and yeah and, and I feel something that that I could 
really kind of meditate on that and just and just meditate on being goo and being happy with my own goo uh-huh. and, and if i've got and if i'm goo then that's that's what i'm meant to be yeah yeah like those times in your life where you just break down in grief over something or someone some loss something like you don't have to put on a happy face and pretend that it's all okay. No, there's times when you just, you need to be goo for a little while. You need to just break down and let it be what it is. This um, is it's easy to, to look at society and think there needs to be more goo in society. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It can be the glue that holds us together. Yeah. And, and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm supposed that um, this deep work, inner work that you've done over the years through mm-hmm. through a lot of hardship as well mm-hmm. um, is now um, what's at the core of of all these teachings and looking at your website, the experience I get is like I need to spend half a day taking notes just <laughs> just getting through your website all the different things that you're offering well i do have a lot of writing on my website <laughs> and, and you and you run writing classes and and you and you run groups social coaching mm-hmm. um as well as webinars and and oh there's so much on there yeah are you busy um busy enough that's good yeah, I, I want to see it expand over time. I I started very gradually a couple of years ago, and it's been just sort of gradually um, expanding, which was very very intentional because I was still vulnerable, still kind of coming out of my own goo, and I didn't want to overload myself and burn out again. Um, but I've been doing this very, very slowly for a couple of years and I'm getting stronger and my wings are getting stronger. Like they also say like when you, when the butterfly comes out of the chrysalis, if you help it, if you break it apart, the butterfly will die. Like it needs the struggle. And I've been stretching my wings and moving the fluids around in the wings. That's what's actually happening. Right. Yeah. And ready for another stage of growth and that feels good that I can say that this really um (laughs) speaks to this holistic approach um that I really like in in um, good coaching good therapy when the Mm -hmm. when the when the supporter is is in the process with the the person being supported Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's pretty obvious to me that that your teaching, your experience at St. John's mm-hmm. is is really speaking to the pedagogy of, of what you're doing now. Yeah, actually, um, like I mentioned that the we call our professors tutors. All of them have some sort of specialty, like they all have a PhD or a master's in something or other, but every one of them is required to teach all of the curriculum. They're required to teach all the classes, the stuff that they're not experts in too. Mm. In fact, the first year that they teach, they're not allowed to teach their specialty area. Um, (laughs) But they form groups to, that work in advance of the students. So they're a few paces ahead of us so that they can help us better. But you don't have to be an expert in everything in order to teach anything. You have to just be ahead of your students. Mm. And I don't think of the people that I'm coaching as students, but I don't have to have like everything perfect before I can start helping. I just Mm. need to be farther along on the path. But where I am on my journey is perfect. And where that other person who's working with me is on their journey is exactly perfect. It's just where they need to be. You can't be behind on your own journey. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. And so I, that's what I love about it is I love just being able to come up, kind of come alongside someone else on their journey, not make it mine, not make it what, like the revelations that I found because their life experience is going to be different than mine. Um, but just come alongside them and be, be someone who can investigate, be someone who can help them through the experience and through figuring out themselves. And of course, autistic adults are um, very much in my heart because it's me. Um, also teenagers, I just, I love teenagers, but autistic teenagers and adults are um, who I'm really talking to, but I've had people who come to me who are identify as highly sensitive people or have sensory processing differences. And um, I love that too. It's, I, I do a lot of sensory stuff because that I found was really, really important in lowering my own stress level and recognizing how, like figuring out how to be comfortable in my own skin, how to be comfortable in the world. That was a big part of it for me. Mm. And are you doing some mm. mindfulness, I notice, and groups? Group yeah. Work? How's yeah, that? I do um, teen classes and social groups and mindfulness groups uh, for teenagers through an online platform called OutSchool. So people can find me on there. Um, and unfortunately they don't allow adults on there, but I'm hoping to, to do like group stuff for adults at some point. I'm, I've got a webinar coming up soon and there'll be others in the future. Mm -hmm. um, this one is on like the five most overlooked, but also the most common uh, stressors for autistic adult, autistic individuals. Um, but also a lot of the same information applies to a lot of people who are highly sensitive or um, live with chronic pain or trauma mm. survivors. Mm. Yeah. And, and just um, bringing it to a little bit about um, the dialogues that you've, that we've sat in together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you got any thoughts on that? Besides I love them. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's all I need. <laughs> that's why I keep signing up for more and more. <laughs> it's good to be around a group of other adults who have, I'm not the same lives, but similar mm. ranges of experience and to be able to, to know you're not alone. Mm. Okay. It's not just me who had that experience or who does that weird thing and maybe it's not that weird it's just everyone's called it that mm. um, it's just certainly great to to have your presence and 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 also um mm. it noted that you're in another country you know because there's there's not a lot of difference in culture but it's definitely uh intriguing to have people in, from mm -hmm. the world in different countries in the room yeah yeah. What about neurodiversity and the way it's going for me and my growth is, is as you know, the, the autism dialogues, which have been going five years, the model has always been on mm -hmm. bringing autistic and non-autistic people together, mm -hmm. sympathetic, obviously, yeah. environment. Um, to, to set up a microcosm of, of our society in a safe way mm -hmm. and explore together. But I think what's naturally been happening is that, is that um, I'm getting more and more interested in, in, in neurodiversity as a, as a global, you know, universal thing, which everybody, mm -hmm. which everybody is, is aligned with, is invested in, because we're all part of the biodiversity of humanity. We've, right. we've all got nervous systems. So I'm getting more and more interested in expanding it out. And it just seems to be growing and, yeah. and not contained by just autism. 
Yeah. There's this whole, we probably don't have time to get into the whole history of um, how we've come to have the idea of there is a typical, like a neurotypical mind, but a lot of it is just the history of how psychological research has been done in Western cultures. Um, it's largely done by and with um, fairly affluent, white, intellectual, educated, um, often men, but to some extent more and more so women. And like that has become the standard of what is supposed to be typical, but that's not actually how most people's brains work, not even within our own Western cultures, mm. never mind in the rest of the world. Like, so that's become a standard, but it's a false standard. It's an ideal that doesn't actually match the majority of people in the world, whether they're autistic or ADHD or not. Um, so neurodiversity acceptance is something that's very, very important to me simply because it's expanding and like, like you can have the idea of trying to have a community that is a fixed community and there are people on the outside of that community and in order for the outsiders to belong they have to conform and come in or and that's what we've generally been doing or you can have the idea of expanding the boundaries of the community to include the outsiders and that's what I want to do is say we're not outsiders let us be a part of it without having to change who we fundamentally are as people yeah yeah that's very well put <laughs> I, I don't know if you know but Laurie Hogan Camp's theories are largely based in traditional communities she, she's got a whole thing about the peripheral mm -hmm. minds of autism yeah I've and seen a little bit of her work not much yeah. yet yeah it is it is fascinating so we we do our little bit we go through our chrysalis goo period and and mm -hmm. and uh you know unfortunately a lot of autistic people don't make it yeah and, um but some do and uh, we we do our little bit where we can and uh it's very humbling to to be speaking with you and uh you know a, a kindred spirit mm. yeah right but if the bounds of the community expand to include autistic people they don't have to make it or not make it exactly and exactly if they're not stigmatized their whole lives then the anxiety the depression the suicide the all of the things that so many of us struggle with and see as just simply realities don't have to be part of our reality. Yeah, and it was, it's, um, it's an assumption for me to say what I just said about right, making, yeah. <laughs> what's this idea of making it, you know, it's, it's just so ingrained. It is. Uh, yeah. it comes up more and more people say say to me particularly autistic people but people who care about autistic um what would life be like if if you wouldn't have to be if you could just be yourself right so i think that's probably a really good place to leave it <laughs> thanks very much for your time heather it's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry, it's so it feels short because of the depth of where <laughs> we're going, but um, there'll be time for more, hopefully. I hope so. Okay, thanks. Take care. You too.